Today we're standing at a window that if you go to St. Catharines, you're obviously much more accustomed to seeing because this is the window, one of the windows, one of the stained glass windows in the main church. And I'm gonna be calling this particular image, the stained glass window, the universal call to holiness, which was a central theme of the Second Vatican Council, even though that teaching has been with the church since her founding. In this image, we, we see clearly the dove, which is always used as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. We also see some flames. At first, I was figuring that these flames might have represented the gifts and the fruits of the Spirit, but there would have to be one more of those. So I'm gonna take it as those are the flames that came to rest as tongues of fire on the day of Pentecost. We also see in this image, we see members of the church. We see a priest, we see a deacon, we see a religious sister, and we also see members of the lay faithful. So that's why I'm calling this particular window the universal call to holiness. At the center of this stained glass window is, as I said, the symbol of the dove, which again is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. There are many symbols of the Holy Spirit. This, the Holy Spirit is often portrayed as fire, it's portrayed as seal, it's portrayed as a hand, the Holy Spirit can be portrayed as a finger. The dove is the most common symbol that's used for the, for the Holy Spirit. In the early church, the dove was used almost exclusively as the symbol of the Holy Spirit. And there are biblical accounts for this. In the Babylonian Talmud, which is a Jewish text and which formed at one time the basis for all rabbinical law, this text said, the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters like a dove. Our scriptural accounts of creation does not actually mention a dove. However, we still see the presence of the Spirit. In Genesis, we read, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form or shape with darkness over the whole abyss and a mighty wind sweeping over the waters. Even though we don't see the dove actually portrayed in that text, the wind is often another sign of the Holy Spirit. The first time, biblically speaking, that we see the image of the dove representing the Holy Spirit is in the story of Noah. When Noah was in his boat because of the flood that devastated the whole earth, Noah releases a dove. And then the dove returns with an olive branch, signifying that the earth was habitable once again. And if you want to read that text, it's in Genesis 8, 8 through 12. The baptism of Jesus, we see a dove present. We read, after Jesus was baptized, he came up from the water and behold, the heavens were open and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and carrying and coming upon him. And that's in Matt 3, 16. And you can find that text in all the synoptics, in all the gospels, I'm sorry. Doves were often used as a sacrifice in the temple, and so when our Lord was presented in the temple by Mary and Joseph, it's likely that they could have actually brought a dove as a sacrifice. Some of the first tabernacles that were ever constructed were often fashioned in the form of a dove, and they would often be suspended above the altar. The Holy Spirit so often is seen as the forgotten person of the Trinity. And it might be due to the fact that the Holy Spirit is often portrayed as a dove. We don't typically have relationships with doves. We can easily picture Jesus. We can easily picture the Father. The Spirit is not something, the Holy Spirit is not something that's easy for us to picture. However, it doesn't mean our relationship with the Spirit should be any less than that of the Father and the Son. It's always important for us to remember that God is a trinity of persons. That means there are three persons in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And even though there are three persons in the Trinity, there is, we always believe firmly that there is only one God. And, even, and they are three distinct persons in the Trinity. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, and yet even despite all that, there still is only one God. So there are three persons in one God. And they're bound together because of the nature which they share. The Fourth Lateran Council said, there are three persons indeed, but one utterly simple substance, essence, or nature. So again, these three divine persons who are co-equal with one another, they share the same substance of godliness with each other, even though the Son is begotten of the Father, and the Father and the Son breathe forth, for the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. But this is an eternal relationship. The Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son is not something that happens in time. It's something that happens for all eternity. The Spirit is the eternal breath of communication between the Father and the Son. There are also many names of the Spirit used in the Scriptures. In the Gospel of John, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Advocate by Jesus himself. The Gospel says, 
And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you always. And that's in John 14, 16. And in verse 26, we hear, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, the Father, will, will come in my name, and he will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. And then we also read in John 15, 26, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth that proceeds from the Father, he will testify to me. And in John 16, 7, for if I do not go, the advocate will not come, but if I go, I will send him to you. In John, the spirit is also called the spirit of truth, and we see this in John 16, 13, but when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. The Holy Spirit is the name most frequently used in the Acts of the Apostles, and we also see some other names throughout the scriptures for the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is referred to as the promise of the Spirit. You can find that in Galatians 3.14, Ephesians 1.13. In Romans 8.15, the Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of adoption. And in Romans 8.9 and 15-19, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. St. Peter refers to the Spirit as the Spirit of glory, and that's in 1 Peter 4.14. Now, we most likely associate the Holy Spirit with Pentecost because that's when the Holy Spirit is fully revealed. However, even in the Old Covenant, the Son and the Spirit are perpetually active, even if they're active in hidden ways. We see that in the Genesis account that we read with the presence of the Spirit being revealed in a veiled form when the wind rushed upon the waters. God's Spirit in the Old Covenant is actively preparing for when the Messiah will be revealed in the fullness of time, as we see in Galatians 4.17. The Spirit is the one who propels the prophets to speak. The promise of the Spirit is seen even in Genesis when three figures appear to Abraham, representing the three figures of the Holy Trinity. As we get to the New Covenant, we actively see the presence of the Spirit at the Annunciation of Mary, when Mary asks how she will conceive without having relations, and the angel says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and that's in Luke 1.35. And Mary, from that point on, becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit, and she becomes a tabernacle of the Most High God. When Jesus is in the temple, he quotes from Isaiah saying, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor, and he has sent me to proclaim proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free. And that's in Luke 1.18. And as we already read about how our Lord, when he was approaching his promise that he would send the Spirit, he would send the Advocate to be with us always. On the day of Pentecost, which happens when the seven weeks of Easter had come to an end, the, pouring, the outpouring of the Spirit is given and communicated as a divine person. And on that day, the Holy Trinity is fully revealed to the church. And then we read in Acts of the Apostles, And suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind. Then there appeared to them tongues of fire, which parted and came to rest on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues, as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. And of course, our baptism, when we were baptized, we were filled with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God from our baptism dwells within us, making us temples of the Spirit. And, and at our confirmation, which is like our own Pentecost, the Spirit is fully given to us, perfecting what we received at baptism and imparting the gifts of the Spirit to us. And the gifts of the Spirit, those are those permanent dispositions that make us docile to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And there's seven of those. They're wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel, piety, fortitude, and fear of the Lord. We could do a whole series just on the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, there's also what are called the fruits of the Spirit, and there are 12 of them. And basically those are the fruits of the Spirit are the perfections that the Holy Spirit forms within us. And those fruits of the Spirit are charity, joy, peace, patience, kindness, um, generosity, fruitfulness, modesty, self-control, and chastity. And there's one, and I can't read my writing on my notes. Much We could obviously say much more about the Holy Spirit, but now we should probably move on to the rest of this image, which we're going to call the, again, the universal call to holiness. The universal call to holiness is a central theme of the Second Vatican Council, even though it's always been a teaching of the church. 
Jesus himself said, be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect. And that's in Matthew 5, 48. St. Francis de Sales, he was known for teaching very strongly that all in the church are called to holiness. And in 1609, he wrote a book that was called Introduction to the Devout Life. Pius XI and Costi Canubi said, all people of every condition can and ought to imitate the most perfect example of holiness. Obviously, we could find quotes from every error in the church. These are just some significant times where holiness was explicitly referenced prior to Vatican II. Even if we look at all the list of canonized saints, the history of the church clearly shows us that people from all walks of life are called to holiness. The church has never taught that holiness was a privilege reserved for a select group in the church. That may have been emphasized more in some eras, less in some eras, but the, the canonizations of all the saints, they come from all different walks of life, and so it clearly shows to us that the church has never said holiness is just for a small group. The teaching on the universal call to holiness is articulated all throughout the text of Vatican II. However, we find this teaching with the most clarity in chapter five of Lumen Gentium, which is the dogmatic constitution on the church. And a dogmatic constitution in, in the Second Vatican Council is the highest teaching authority of that council. Pope John XXIII in his homily when he opened up Vatican II said, the greatest concern of the ecumenical council is that this is the sacred deposit of Christian doctrine should be more effectively defended and presented. This, teach, this teaching embraces the whole human person, body and soul, and it commends us as pilgrims who dwell on earth to, to strain eagerly towards the heavenly homeland. All the popes since have affirmed the central teaching of Vatican II on the universal call to holiness. Pope Paul VI said, this invitation to holiness could be regarded as the most characteristic element in the whole magisterium of the council, and so to say its ultimate purpose. Pope John Paul II said, Vatican, the Vatican Council has significantly spoken on the universal call to holiness. It is possible to say that this call to holiness is precisely the basic charge entrusted to all the sons and daughters of the church by a council which intended to bring a renewal of Christian life based on the gospel. Pope Francis, he wrote an apostolic letter called Gaudete Exultate, which was titled On the Call to Holiness in Today's World. So a whole document that he wrote just on the call to holiness in our world. The first document that was promulgated by the Second Vatican Council was Sacrosanct Concilium, and that was the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. And even though it's the first document which would be promulgated, which would be published, we see this call to holiness present the Vatican, uh, Sacrosanctum, Sacrosanctum Concilium said that the general, the first and most general goal of the council was to impart, an, to impart an ever, with ever increasing vigor to the Christian life of the faithful. And so that's why at the Second Vatican, in Sacrosanctum Concilium, there's that strong emphasis on the need for full, active, conscious participation in liturgy, so that through the liturgy, we can grow in holiness. So we probably should ask, what did Vatican II actually say in chapter five of Lumen Gentium, which is titled on Universal Call to Holiness? The first line of chapter five of Lumen Gentium said, the church whose mystery is being set forth by this sacred synod is believed to be indefatigably holy. Couldn't get that word out for some reason. Then the text goes on to say how the church is holy because Christ with the Father and the Son is holy and the church is his bride, and he gave himself up for her to sanctify her. And we read that, and they were quoting from Ephesians 5, 25 to 26. And the council goes on to say, he joined himself to her and endowed her with the gifts of the spirit for the glory of God. The council explicitly says that all in the church are called to holiness and quotes 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification. The council goes on to say how holiness is expressed in many, in many ways, but also individually, each in his own state of life. And the council says that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit so that we may interiorly grow, grow with God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And again, they were quoting Matt 12:30, and that we should, with that, love our neighbor as ourselves. 
quote in Mark 12, 31. The council talks about how the followers of Christ have been made sons and daughters of God through baptism and partakers of the divine nature. And so we are truly sanctified because of that sacrament. Despite that, we still offend in many ways, and so we have to constantly pray for God's mercy and pray every day to forgive us our debts, as we read in Matt 6, 12. The council states how, all, then the council goes on to state how holiness is to be achieved in all forms of Christian life, and the perfection of love can be attained by all, and we become leavens, of, leavens in our earthly society when we attain holiness. The council goes on to show how holiness is clearly shown in the history of the church through the lives of many saints. And even though the tasks of life are many, holiness is one, and yet we each use our own gifts and duties to advance along the way of living in the faith. The council then goes on to talk about holiness in each state of life. First talks about shepherds and says that shepherds are the image of the eternal high priest and should carry out their mission in holiness in eagerness, humility, and fortitude, and how their ministry is a means of sanctification. It then talks specifically about bishops, about priests, about deacons. Then the council goes on to talk about married couples and parents and how they should support one another all throughout their life with faithful love and should form their children as a blessing and see their children as a blessing from God and should instill in them Christian doctrine and virtues. In this way, they become an example of generous love as they build up the brotherhood of charity and stand as witnesses of the fruitfulness of Mother Church as a sign of the love which Christ has loved his bride and given himself up for her. The church even said that widows and single people also contribute to the holiness of the church in a unique way. The council said that the, those who then work should do, should do all for the betterment of human society and to in, end in imitation of Christ who plied his hands with carpenter's tools and is always working with the Father and the Son for the salvation of all. The council then spoke about those who are weighed down with poverty, infirmity, sickness, and those who suffer persecution for justice sake and how they should realize that they are united with Christ who suffers for the salvation of all. The council said we, we attain holiness when we frequently practice the sacraments mainly the Eucharist, and when we take part in the liturgy. And we should constantly apply ourselves to prayer, to self-denial, and we should act in brotherly service and practice all of the virtues. The council then talks about how our Lord showed his love by laying down his life for us, and how some have been called and will always be called to giving testimony of that love through the ultimate sacrifice of martyrdom. And how, when someone is martyred, they, the disciple becomes like the master. And the church always considers this the highest gift and supreme act of love. And the council mentions how persecution will always be a part of the church reality. We can sum up this chapter of the universal call to holiness, again from chapter 5, with one quote from Lumen Gentium. Accordingly, all Christians in the conditions, duties, and circumstances of their life, and through all of these, will sanctify themselves more and more if they receive all things with faith from the hand of the Heavenly Father and cooperate with the divine will, thus showing forth in that temporal service the love with which God has loved the world. So all of us, regardless of our state in life, are called to holiness, and we're each called to holiness in a unique way because our life circumstances are, different, are different. The saints certainly show us that we can be holy no matter what our state in life is. We could probably better put it as Galatians 2.20 says, Yet I live no longer I, but Christ lives in me. In so far as I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So the mission of church is the spreading of the gospel, and that can only happen if, if Christ, in the power of the Spirit, who makes, us, who makes of us an earthly offering to our Heavenly Father, if we do all that in a spirit of holiness. The church is established by Christ, not established by any human person, and the disciples of Christ, together in the spirit, are bound together in a spirit of holiness. The sole purpose of the church is to make us holy so that we can attain salvation. It's also important for us to remember that the church is perfectly holy in her teaching and also in her sacraments. But the church is also sinful because its members, that means you, that means me, all the members of the church, were sinners. 
But again, the perfect teaching of the church is passed on to us through Christ in the church, in her teaching, and in her sacraments. And yet it's always God who makes the church holy, and it's always God who makes us holy. So I'm just going to close with a quote from Pope Benedict XVI when he was speaking on holiness, and he said, In Christ's life, God made himself visible, close, available, and tangible, so that each might draw from the fullness of grace and truth. In Jesus Christ, holiness, the fullness of Christian life, does not consist in carrying out extraordinary enterprises, but in being but in being united with Christ in living his mysteries in making our own his example, his thoughts and behaviors. A holy life is not primarily the result of our own efforts. It is God who sanctifies us. It is the Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, it is the Holy Spirit's actions that enlivens us from within. Thanks for watching. The next video, you're not gonna be able to see me either. Just be able to hear me, maybe the Video will be, the window will be a little more visible. Some things I would recommend to you if you want to read some stuff on holiness. Most, the book, the, one book, Introduction to the Devout Life that I mentioned by St. Francis de Sales, that's an excellent book. I'm very surprised we actually don't have that in the St. Catherine's Library. When the parish is open again, by the way, the parish library is an excellent library. There's amazing, some really great books in there. And we just cleaned it during this pandemic time. Um, so it's all cleaned, and it's ready for parishioners to be more active and start reading some of those books. So when you're at the parish, again, maybe consider after Masses, if you want to do some spiritual reading, you can certainly uh, stop in there and pick up a book. And I would also recommend, obviously, from the Vatican Council, Lumen Gentium. You can read the whole document. You can get it for free. You can order all the documents of Vatican II online at Amazon. The one we have, the text we have of the documents of Vatican II is by... Pauline Press, and again, or you could just read chapter five of Lumen Gentium on the universal call to holiness. And uh, finally, I would just recommend also that apostolic exhortation by Pope Francis, which you can also get for free online. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon, St. Catharines.